Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. If you are watching this on YouTube, then you get to see how incredible the setting is. Today we are at the Barnes Tennis Center, uh, located in San Diego, California. It's a beautiful 86 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. We're very close to SeaWorld, and we have the top tennis talent in Southern California here. Uh, we're here to interview Ryan Redondo, CEO of Barnes Tennis Center. And this podcast, if you're listening for the first time, if you're listening in the car, if you're listening on audio, um, thank you. We're grateful if it's your first time. Digital hospitality is our thesis. We think that every business needs to be biz needs to be digital and every business needs to be in the hospitality business. Every single week we have the top leaders around the world, thought leaders, people that are dreamers, people that are doing big things, um, not just in the digital space, not just in the political space, not just in marketing, not just in sales, not just in, uh, you name it, we've, we've covered it. And our job is to keep you engaged every week to know that there's a lot going on in 2020 and beyond with the smartphone. Uh, really, we want to make things a lot easier than they are for marketing and creating digital media. We're a barbecue media company. We have a single unit in Spring Valley, and yet here we are on a Tuesday afternoon. Nothing's more important in the world than coming down and sitting and talking to another fellow dreamer. <laughs> Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for, for being here, and th uh, thank you for letting me steal the line of, of a fellow dreamer. Uh, yeah. Last time we met, Brian, I'll let Ryan tell the story, but welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me and, and joining me here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, it's amazing for me when I start to think about our digital hospitality journey, why somebody listens to the podcast, why someone told them um, that it would be a good idea for a barbecue restaurant to come and talk to the CEO of a Barnes Tennis Center. Um, we just met. I mean, it was only one week ago, and yet we've had a couple conversations about your plans for the future, um, your plans as trustee now of this board of directors, this big broad vision for creating a tennis mecca for youth sports here in, um, in San Diego, Southern California, and globally. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got to there. Oh, yeah. the, the journey. The journey. Yeah, the journey. Give me, bring me back to the journey. Because, um, because I grew up playing tennis. I haven't shared it on the podcast. We'll talk about it throughout. But you're, you, you grew up in the professional side. Like yeah. you, you've, been a, you've been a head coach. You've ran a program. Um, and you've done some incredible work on multiple levels of tennis. Yeah. And yet you find yourself back home. Yeah, yeah. And, and back home, I spent the last about decade up in the Central Valley in Stockton. Okay. I was the head coach at the University of the Pacific. And um, it, I would say to what brought me here is really the start in Stockton as a head coach there. I was only 26, um, not uh, the most prestigious San Diego kind of reputation, Stockton, California. Um, but I had a vision that um, I couldn't just be a coach, right? I couldn't just be the one thing there to develop that program. And when I looked at it, I looked at the community and, um, and I thought if I can build and help be a part of this community in all ways, then I'm going to help my program. I'm going to help this university and represent this school. And um, I started doing a lot of work from there in the community, um, simply lining blacktops, you know, with the help of the USTA. I, we'd go into schools, we would line their blacktops up with tennis courts. Really? And we would provide them equipment. We would provide the PE teachers with the training of how to teach it. And um, that was kind of the start uh, back in 2010 of kind of my personal philosophy of like, okay, I love tennis, I'm gonna coach but there's something else inside of me that I want to use this as a platform to, to help and to grow community. And so it was with kind of that, those efforts that then led to building a brand new tennis center that was going to you know, really be the hub of tennis in Northern California in the Central Valley. We brought numerous junior tournaments, national tournaments, ATP professional tournaments and everything just really behind the scope of I'm just thinking about it now, kind of lining blacktops, Yeah, you know, and so over the course of coaching the teams, developing the teams, tournaments. By lining blacktops, you're still having to put a net, right? Yeah. So you're providing them with the net, but outside of the net and the lines, you can start playing tennis. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So started with that, building a facility and uh, developing community and, um, and, you know, fast forward to, you know, 10 years later. 
and the Barnes Tennis Center, which is an, um, owned and operated by Youth Tennis San Diego, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, I, I'm the CEO of. The signature outreach program of the nonprofit is the Kathy Willett After School Program. And that's what I was like, I really want this to be the, the, the leader and to be a part of this organization. Um, and so the After School Tennis Program, they go into all the schools and rec centers across the city and provide tennis and provide tennis for kids that can't afford it, yeah. um, that need educational opportunities. So we provide tennis, education, um, all the social, you know, mental, physical, holistic things that kids need that don't get them. Um, we provide that for this city and then hopefully bring some of those kids back to the Barnes Tennis Center. And, you know, here we are today and we're starting to develop and, and grow that and um, continue that legacy. That's super interesting. And when I start to think, it always starts with a bigger vision, right? Yeah. It's something that compels you why we do what we do, why we wake up in the morning, why we're excited to be. Do, when you're doing the work that you want to do, time doesn't matter. In fact, you don't have enough time in the day to accomplish all the things you want to accomplish. But one of the things that I respected the most was that you're somebody that's willing to ask for help. Uh, my business mentor is starting to teach me the power of asking for help. And the we've always believed in a rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. um, we don't say all boats because right now we need ships. Ships are going to help all the other boats. Yeah. But really, we need leaders that can help us achieve goals that are bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Um, Eduardo Sanchez, who is an uncle, a big brother, part of my family. I grew up playing tennis. He was my tennis coach. Um, Eduardo Sanchez, the head coach of Rancho Valencia. And um, him and I have this deep connection because of tennis. My grandfather and my grandmother, uh, my grandfather's Bulgarian, my grandmother is Japanese, not by blood, but they both became, they actually started dating because of tennis, their <laughs> love of tennis and that poured into them wanting me to play tennis, me to play tennis with them. And you know, growing up playing tennis for me in Southern California here in San Diego was something that I learned so many things on the tennis court that now that I think about it and I go back, mm -hmm. they impacted how I learned football, how I learned basketball, the things that I do. And that's the power of an after school program, right? That's something that's so powerful. Eduardo Sanchez asked me, to, you have to meet Ryan. You have to meet him because there's something inspiring about him. And we were able to meet. What made you reach out to people like Eduardo to start to build what you're trying to build here? Um, well, I mean, Eduardo is amazing and, and it's the energy of people. And it's the vision, the shared vision of um, what, what I would say, and uh, my vision for, for this organization and San Diego, uh, it's a, a Buddhist term, interconnected co-arising, where, like you said, the sh you know, all rising tides. So everything's, everything is interconnected and will co-arise at certain times. Mm -hmm. And a guy like Eduardo wants to be a part of a rising for other people. Yeah. And he wants to push and he wants to innovate and he wants to figure things out. And so for me, you know, not even knowing, you know, that you are connected to him yes. or anything. I was like, it, for our, you know, our, our snack bar, our, our uh, kitchen, I went to Eduardo. Yes. Who do you got? Because yeah. I know that he's going to think and he's going he's gonna to be pondering, all right, who's the best person for this? Who's going to push it forward? And um, that's how I usually think of people, you know, yeah. who wants to be a part of co-arising, who wants to be a part of building something. You know, and that's, that's the, the thing, thing that excites me the most by being a barbecue media that puts on a podcast that does YouTube is we can share ideas like this over the internet, over yeah. Apple Podcasts, over Spotify, um, over Instagram, over LinkedIn. And you just never know what is going to resonate in someone's story. But so many people over the globe love the sport of tennis. Mm -hmm. they, are, they absolutely love the sport of tennis. And if somebody asked, would you be willing to help in this shared vision? Especially here in San Diego. You've already seen people stepping up to the plate once you're sharing what you're excited about and what you want to create. Yeah. Tell me about that process and about how receptive people have been. Um, well, since I, so I was hired in May 1st and my, you know, even in the interview question and when I got the job, you know, what is your, 30, 60, you know, and to me it was building bridges. Yeah. That's what I said. 
I'm going to build bridges to all of the relationships that we need and that we can have for to build us, to build yeah. this organization and to help ultimately kids. Everything that we do goes back into the youth of San Diego. Yeah. Everything we do. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's, it's how, many, how many bridges can we build um, for tennis? And if it's barbecue, if it's physical therapy, yes. if it's anything that helps us build that bridge network, it's just going to be more people that have interest in what we're doing or might know somebody that's interested in what we're doing. And again, it interconnects all society. And we're not just on our own little island doing one thing, and you're not just in your own little island. Your mastery is our mastery, and we all kind of got to fit in together and help each other. And that's, you know, that's, those are the ships that we need. That's what I Correct. think. Correct, yeah. And so. I mean, I think that's the exciting part is until, until you go, we had Daryl Stinson on the podcast, and he was talking about his church. Um, he's a pastor and, you know, this incredible man, but he was talking about a, a, a program that they had for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about even within the church, there's people that have prejudgments about what the homeless are, even though they're in the church. Yeah. And he's like, if you just come and see, if you come and see, if you come to the location, if yeah. they come and they meet you and you tour them around this facility and all of the hard courts that you have and the clay courts and the vision for the paddle ball courts and the vision for the, you know, this, this place where people, the French Open just finished, yeah. you know, at the recording of this podcast. Imagine if there was a place, COVID safe, that the top tennis, anyone, any family that loves tennis could come and watch, you know, Nadal play yeah. um, the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Imagine, even though it wasn't the greatest match, yeah. if we could all watch together. And that's, part, that's the community that you talk about. And that's, that's the thing that is exciting because it's not about race, it's not about religion, it's not about how much money you have. Yeah. It's about something that's bigger than yourself. Absolutely. And we're not just one thing. Yeah. You know, um, we're never just one thing to, to be something really big, you know. And that's something here, we're a junior facility, but we're hosting, we just finished hosting the ITA Masters. Um, which was on ESPN, and you know we're not streaming on ESPN. Streaming on ESPN, awesome. it'll be aired again on Thursday. But we're not just that, you know, we're that so that there's a trickle down effect for the five year old. Yes. You know, and that's what I, that's my goal is if we have a master's event, we're going to have a junior event. Yes. If we have a college event, we're going to have a professional event. If we have our junior aces program, three to five year olds, have them next to our elite juniors because they're all interconnected and they're inspiring each other and and we're just you know we're we're everything that's what that's my goal and that's my vision I mean, isn't that great the, there was a, a picture I, I mean it must have been on instagram but the the woman that won um the french open the 19 year old yeah she loves rafa nadal like her favorite idolizes him but like she shows a picture of her at a, on a tennis court wherever they were but she was on the court watching him practice wow and it was so inspirational for her but then now she's won the french open yeah. and roland garros she has the trophy and she's like i can't believe i just won the same time rafa did yeah but it's that shared experience where you have the top right before we started this podcast you had the top um tennis player in the entire country from ucla top number one champion yeah. here practicing it takes another kid that's, you know, working on trying to improve his game to, yeah. to learn from that. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. He, Keegan Smith, he's here. 80 feet away, we have a junior that's 13 right now, you know, practicing. Imagine what he's thinking. Yeah. You know, imagine the, the inspiration, the motivation, you know, that he has, you know, 80 feet away right now. That's, that's what we're doing. So there's a lot of people in youth sports, not just tennis, but they grow up and they get exposed to something and it's so intense that they burn out and they go, I don't want to have anything to do with that sport. You're somebody that grew up in the business, the business of tennis. You, were, you had high expectations, but now did you ever experience that burnout? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, my father was the oldest of nine in San Diego, wow. the Redondo family. And uh, they all played, you know, and they were all very good tennis players. Um, nine. Nine of them, yeah. One of uh, my aunt Marita um, went pretty far at Wimbledon. My uncle Walter was, um, you know, just one of the. He was one of the best juniors in the world at one point. Played played the Grand Slams. Um, so, uh, not that there was a lot of pressure, but there's expectations. Yeah. And whenever I made those expectations too much, I burnt out, you know. And I was one of the 
top juniors throughout my whole career. I played on the junior national team, won, you know, I was a part of the the Junior Davis Cup team for the U.S. that won it for the very first time wow. in Australia. We beat Croatia. Um, but, you know, there was definitely times, the ebbs and flows of the current and the tides that uh, when my expectations got out of line, I burnt out, you know, and um, I definitely, I think, I think everybody does at some yeah. point, but it's how do you come back from it? you know, and how do you bring it back? And, and I was able to do that a lot with help from my father and my coaches. And Did you have anyone in spe- specific at any of those points that gave you a story or something that you latched onto that helped you? Yeah, yeah. Well, my dad was my coach all throughout out the juniors. And then uh, I played college tennis at Pepperdine University my freshman year. And then I transferred, I played at San Diego State. Okay. And um, my coach at San Diego State, John Nelson, um, totally changed my perspective on sport, which changed my perspective on life. <laughs> and I went from um, a burnt out stage in my career, because I was very good up in 16, 17, 18s, you know, to at Pepperdine making the sweet 16 with them, to really getting burnt out. And within a semester at San Diego State, won a national championship. San Diego State's only national championship. Oh, wow. So a total change. and. Um, one of his comments was blossom where you're planted and I would you know as an 18 year old totally burnt out with like oh I should be on tour now what am I doing I'm in college because at that time it wasn't the the same it, it wasn't given the same respect as it does now being a college athlete you're very you have every opportunity to go professional but when I was younger you, that wasn't the norm yeah. and so I was you know what am I doing and it was blossom where you're planted Wherever you are, just you know, you're uh, you're on the freeway and you see a daisy or you see a weed that's blossoming. Wherever you are, blossom where you're planted. And so, I literally took that every step of the way, and changed my career. You know, changed my. I'm. I feel like I'm here today because of that. Um, we would do. I remember my first semester. It was hey Ryan, we're gonna meet in the uh, the blue room instead of practice today, and I had no idea what he's talking about. I get in there and it's a blue mat and we're doing jujitsu. <laughs> and he's like, no, this is, this is real pressure. Yeah. You know? And, and so now I wasn't thinking like a tennis player, I was doing jujitsu on the court. Yeah. I was totally detached and just in the present moment. And, um, that was a time, you know, if I can go back to a time that really changed the course and had a mentor that pushed me the right way, I would say that was him. I mean, that's, it's incredible. It's beautiful and it's profound. I mean, blossom where you're planted is something that it's so easy to always strive for something more. Striving and dreaming for something more, that's great, but not living in the present and appreciating the things of what you can do where you are. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I've shared on this podcast, but I'm, I'm in recovery. And my sponsor, he, he told me something that I haven't been able to get out of my head, especially recently, because I've shared it with people that not, aren't typically the people that I talk to in recovery. And that's, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Mm, right beautiful. here, right now, yeah. you are exactly where you're supposed to be. And when you start to think like that, you can start to appreciate the things that are around you. Mm-hmm. And I see kids here that are you know, a little bit older than my kids. I have young kids and I've taken them to play tennis and you forget all those things until you're exposed to them again and those stories that you learn. You grew up in a tennis family. I mean, you have a family now. Now all of what you see here every day only re-inspires that well to blossom where you were planted. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how have you used what you've learned at San Diego State and then now transitioning to here on the topic of mental health? Because mental health, I don't think, gets talked enough about. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't think we'd talk about it on a digital hospitality podcast. Uh, I played tennis and I remember mental toughness. Mm-hmm. And mental toughness is probably as far away from mental health as you can get yeah. because it's being tough in the game, being competitive, not letting outside distractions yeah. um, get to you showing no weakness mental health on the other hand mind body and spirit we don't often as leaders as men talk about what are we doing to mentally take care of ourselves yeah what uh what's your philosophy around mental health and and how it can how tennis in particular youth tennis how you can start to to talk about it um, in the program 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge uh, stepping stone, I think, to the next evolution of sport is really to be able to bring about what mental health is, right? Because you use that word toughness. Mental, you know, be, you need to, or a coach, you need to be more mentally tough, yeah. you know, and you need this or, and that's, it's so far from the truth. Isn't it funny? Yeah. Like and, we grew up with those things. Yeah. But then when you think about it and then you get to the burnout stage and, you know, I have friends, whether they were in soccer or whatever, that it gets to the point where you're like, I don't even want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think in it, because it takes you farther from yourself. Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. And when you are just yourself and you can accept that. And you can accept that I'm scared. Yeah. And you can accept that I'm nervous. And you can accept all those things. That's the real, well, I'll use the word mastery or evolution or blossoming of, of an individual. Yeah. And I think that's where tennis in particular um, provides a great platform. Yeah. And uh, there's a group, the Evolutionary Sports, that I've been working with. Uh, they were previously called Sports Energy and Consciousness. And it's about bringing the consciousness back to the sport. Whereas, you know, we have a net, but I need you and yeah. I need you to be your best. If we're competing together to become my best, then we can figure all that stuff out together, you know, rather than I'm going to go kick your ass. Correct. It's all right. You play your best. That's going to make me provide my best. Yes, I want to win. And winning is important to a, to a degree. Sure. But there's a different uh, competition. It's competir, which means to strive together. Yeah. And so when we have this, we have the opportunity now in all sports, in everything we do, to bring that striving together and competing healthily in business uh, in so many different ways, which is gonna, which is gonna change mental health. Yeah. Um, and I would say mental health isn't always just thought uh, cognitive, it's also physiological, it's in the body. And, and so I've done some work you know, uh, personally for mental health issues mm -hmm. and with my teams that I've coached with, um, in doing using different modalities methods of being able to bring back uh, what's true and bring you back to yourself um, and so you know, there's lots of different practices that I've been been experimenting with and coaching and using um, one of my favorite ones is uh, emotional um, uh, I'm blanking right now uh, but it, it's through tapping okay. emotional freedom techniques okay so there's a there's a, a, a process of tapping the energy points that you have while you're, while you're being, while you're accepting yourself. When I tell myself the truth, I feel whatever it is, yes. you can tap. And that is mental health, right? Right now, I am nervous, I'm on a podcast, yeah. or I am excited, or I'm overly excited, and, but it brings me back. And so um, I've been practicing it. I'm a huge um, proponent of bringing this into sport at a higher level, I think, the federations and the associations are doing a good job of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need to do better. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that are, are really putting it forth um, that I've seen recently. And so I'm, I'm super excited about that. That's very encouraging. It's very encouraging when leaders start adopting it, you know, as part of a com not just a conversation, but as part of what, what we do and how we do it. I mean, we're building a new digital restaurant for the future and we're reinventing what it is to be a restaurant, to provide food both digitally, in person, but we also want to be better to our team. You know, working in the heart of the house, working as a server, working as a bartender, working as a full service manager, like, you know, we want to provide opportunities for them to also not have to burn the candle on both ends. Yeah. Because in the hospitality business, all we do is spend every all of our time taking care of people yeah like we're always taking care of Serving. people nobody's teaching us to take care of ourselves because yeah. if, if we actually take care of ourselves we'll be able to better take care of other people yeah um, tell me just about basics give me some uh, how many courts do we have how many coaches what's the program what yeah so Barnes Tennis Center has 25 courts okay uh, we currently have 23 hard courts and two clay courts they're all lit um, we current we now have three pickleball courts. Awesome! Yeah, you were telling me about that. Yeah, That's yeah. super exciting. It's a it's the fastest growing sport in the U.S. I can't believe. Since you've told me that, I talked to Derek Marzo, who's the co-host of Behind the Smoke. He owns Valley Farm Market. He literally just built a pickleball court at his house. That's awesome. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I'm like, I just talked about pickleball. He's like, he has friends. Uh, he sponsors over the line, and they played pickleball at some court, and they absolutely loved it. Yeah. I, I had no idea. I mean it. There, there's your proof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, there's your proof right there. It's yeah. growing. I think I just saw something over the weekend in the NBA bubble. 
Oh when yeah, they, they were playing in the bubble. They were playing when they weren't on the court. Amazing. You know, just to release some steam, they were playing pickleball. So what is pickleball? Uh, pickleball is, uh, I think it was invented in Canada. Okay. Uh, but it's played with, you know, we can see it on our tour. Okay. They're actually out there behind right the, now. Yeah, we're going to do a, a behind the scenes tour for all the YouTube subscribers. If you're not subscribed, go to Cali Barbecue Media and make sure to uh, get the incredible uh, Rising Tides Creative. Brandon's here and Aaron, um, they're going to do a great job wrapping up kind of uh, this tennis center. Where it is yeah. now, but also the vision for the future. Yeah. yeah. So we can come back to this content and repurpose it and go, yeah. this is where we were in 2020 and look at where we've come yeah yeah absolutely so yeah 25 court facility um we also have the booth education center okay uh, that hosts our junior aces program three to five year olds they come in for educational purposes from 9 to 12 30. they play an hour of tennis our director of that is lindsay vosberg she runs that with um uh, with her staff and it's it's awesome i love that program it's That's so inspiring super cool. Yeah, really? It's, it's really cool. And it's a lot open of, to the public? It's open to the public. Um, and then right now all classes are outside. Are they full? COVID. Are you guys full? Uh, we do have space. Really? Yeah, but I, I'll let her make those judgments. Yeah, okay. I'll, She's in we'll, charge we'll, we'll there. Go through the proper channels. <laughs> Good, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, a lot of the kids that are in that program and are in our other programs um, have come through that. Okay. Um, so it's, that's, it, it's awesome. It's got a playground and a computer room, a library. Um, all those kind of things. And so um, it's, to me, one of the most beautiful facilities in the world. I can say that. There's bigger facilities and there's some amazing facilities, but we're at the end of the West uh, Interstate 8, Yes. you know, right next to Ocean Sunset Beach. Cliffs. Sunset, Sunset Cliffs. Sunset Cliffs are right, right down the road. Yeah. 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 Palm trees. Um, you know, 35 years ago, I lived in Ocean Beach and I remember the parrots. Yes. And so when I moved back here in May, Barnes Tennis Center was closed to the public. So it was just a lot of time just me here walking around dreaming, what is this place going to be? Yeah. You know, and there were so many parrots. The parrots have quadrupled, if not more, in oh, this wow. area, which I love. Kind of a backstory, but no, that's, uh, that that's kind of gives you an idea where we're at, you know, that you can go surf. You're right here. you got the parks around here. It's beautiful. So how the tennis center was built at the, what, 1996? 90, July 1995. 1995, and about $4.5 million facility at that time. Now we're here in 2020. Um, how much money do you need to raise to build the dream that you and the board of directors and the youth of tennis deserve? I. Uh, on the low end, I think $5 million right now. Okay. You know, to look, when I look for the, fu when I look at the future of Youth Tennis San Diego and the Barnes Tennis Center, well beyond my time, well beyond our time, um, right now, we, I want to raise about $5 million to create the community of the Barnes Tennis Center that I can see is going to really push um, Point Loma forward, um, San Diego, our youth, and then tennis. How do you raise $5 million? Create a vision, right? Be able to share that vision. Um, it's the way in which you tell the story and you got to tell the story about how it's going to help people and, and build this community. That's how you fundraise and then you got to ask. Yeah. And you got to build relationships and make every, this is not my thing. This is not the board's thing. This is everybody's. Yeah. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what we're going to you know, be able to provide. Yeah, I think that's the probably the biggest challenge that most businesses faced is clarifying their vision, mm -hmm. clarifying their why, getting back to the why, because there's so many things that complicate why we do what we do. Yeah. But when you get back to the heart of the mission yeah. of why we're doing what we're doing for community and to build tennis as a vehicle for children to have access, to have structure, to have outdoor activities. I mean, the, all the benefits that come with learning a sport like tennis. Yeah. Um, it's one of the sports I was telling you before the podcast, I have friends that I grew up with that were tremendous athletes. They played basketball, they played soccer, um, they played football, and they never played tennis. Mm -hmm. But now during coronavirus, they've realized that there's a tennis court, it's socially distance safe, you know, they've always, they want to get some activity. And then now that they're playing it, they absolutely love it. Yeah. They absolutely love it. Yeah. You know, and they can't get enough of it. And it's, um, it's brought me back to playing more tennis and, um, 
it's something my grandfather would always tell me it's one of the sports that you can always play the longest. My grandfather yeah. played till he was 80 years old. Yeah. You know? That's, it's a beautiful sport. It's safe. Yeah, like you said, you know, I mean, during COVID, it's, you're 78 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're outside. Um, it's, it's, to me, tennis is so many different sports in one. You know, yeah. the movement of a basketball player, side to side, all directions, jumping, you know, the throwing motion of a pitcher, the mental strategic way of one-on-one, -on -one, like boxing. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, it, that's why it's, it's a very complex sport. It's very difficult to pick up in certain ways. Um, but then kind of going back to that consciousness side, every single time you strike a ball, you're present, right? Yeah. And it, so it always, and that's where that connection comes, you know, or if you're in a batting cage, you want more, right? Yes. Why? Because every time you connect, you're here right now. And it's like, and I think to, to me, like kind of, you know, not spiritually thinking, but bringing it back to the source of just your present, boom, present, yes. boom. And I think that's why people get hooked. Yeah, I, I, that's a great, great way to describe it. The one th we were talking about the tennis podcast that you listened that yeah. you, you were telling me about behind the racket, yeah, um, and the success of how that story, that storytelling method, has was shared to you, was shared to other tennis players, and now you know is a podcast when it started, you know, just as an idea shared uh -huh. on digital. Um, why were you why are you so compelled by what they were doing at but behind the racket? Um. Well, one, it's about tennis, so it's yeah. like it, it definitely brings you to something close that you can identify with. But then when I first um, read it uh, and it and the, the players were sharing their story, their life story, it humanizes everything about the sport. And it could be behind the, the basketball. It could behind be behind smoke. anything, <laughs> behind the smoke, right? But it behind brings, the the, it, yeah, brings it back and, and um, you know, there really what it comes down to is there's no right way to do anything or to get anywhere and uh, Noah and Mike that that run that um, have chant you know some amazing players some of the best in the world and then you read their story and you're like wow there's no right way you don't have to fall in line yeah to become a champion or to become a better version of yourself there's struggle and that's life and yeah so that's one of the podcasts we talked about that I, I listen to all the time um, but those are the kind of stories, those are what motivate me to, to you know, do what I'm doing. And what kind of plans do you have for the digital side for Barnes Center, the media side for Barnes Center, sharing the stories of all the stuff that you're talking about and all these great players that are coming through here? Yeah, um, well, the, the digital side is I'd really like to, to live stream these courts. Awesome. That's gonna take some fundraising. Yep. Um, but I want people from everywhere to be able to see the kids playing and when, we have all these tournaments. I want, and, and the, the kids can only come with one parent or, if, yep. or a coach. I want the families to be able to connect. Yep. And so the more we can connect people to watching kids play tennis and, or if we have pro events, that's one big aspect that I'm prioritizing right now. That's that would exciting. be, that's what this center needs. Um, and it would help a lot of different avenues to the industry and, and for, for eventually the players. Sure. Um, I'd like to see our, our programs that we have now we have programs from three-year-olds to 18 year olds yeah uh, from every for every level and I'd like to see a better digital platform for the parents to learn more when they're home yes because they're investing in what we're offering them and a lot of times we get the questions well what what else could we do because our programs are only two days a week you know for the say the red ball the five to six year olds so I, I'm envisioning right now okay how can we provide them a digital platform so that they can do more with their kids. Now, mom and dad are actually now teaching or yes. they're on the court. Now they're learning. You know, if they don't play tennis, yes. now we're just growing, they're growing a better relationship. Yes. Uh, they're, they're learning tennis. And so there's just so many ways that to, to bring the digital platform to what we're doing here to affect so much of life. It's incredible. Uh, I mean, we, so we need it. Yeah, it's, we uh, just, the first daycare we ever took my son to, um, they had an app that they used called Brightwheel. Mm -hmm. And Brightwheel, it enabled the teacher to
to essentially they had their whole schedule planned out so we knew what was going to happen yeah. during the day but it enabled them to take photos of what they were doing or video and it would just be a notification on our phone which as a parent is something that i know i've already talked to other parents that they don't want digital in their kids mm -hmm. classrooms or they don't want it in their daycare because yeah. they want the focus to be on the children I, on the other hand, when I see the pictures and I see the sun smile of my son when he's working on an arts and crafts project, yeah. it becomes such a powerful moment for me. And back to what you're saying about live streaming or you know, connecting parents to just the tools that you need that you can actually extend the play beyond Barnes. Yeah. So when you go back home, it doesn't always have to be about tennis, but here's some mental things here's some physical things that you exactly. can do that will relate back to tennis yeah exactly. you know it's that ecosystem that digital ecosystem of you know all the great coaches that are out here I mean each coach there's a reason why they're spending the time out there right mm -hmm. I mean and each the, the reason that it's exciting is because each of them tells a different story yeah they relate in a different way you were a coach I mean yeah. as a coach it, each player is different yeah you're yeah. gonna connect with them on a different level based off of how you approach it yeah yeah, exactly. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? I know you guys have a, a, a big fundraiser, a virtual fundraiser um, yeah. coming up, uh, probably when this podcast is going to be coming out. Yeah, um, yeah, the 31st annual. 31st it's annual. The Match Point Gala. Um, this year, because of COVID reasons, we are going virtual. And um, it's a great opportunity for, for people to be a part of what we're doing. All of the proceeds go back to after school tennis. So that goes to. Uh, hiring coaches to go into the schools. So we do six week sessions in the after school program and a coach will go in and um, and they'll run that program for six weeks. Sometimes they'll do multiple programs at that one school and they'll do several different schools. So we, that helps us pay for the coaches, that helps us pay for permits um, to be in the schools, insurances, mm -hmm. equipment, all those kind of things. And so uh, when you think about the thousands of kids that we get to touch in in the aspect of tennis um, this virtual gala is really big for us and um, we're just we're we're uh, really excited for it our executive director of the youth tennis san diego foundation barbara edwards is doing an amazing job um, we did some filming to connect with people Great. so people can go online they can uh, see the items that we have barbara and i are are emceeing it and uh, we did some video on it so it's really important. And I know you have a bigger vision, not just for San Diego, but for also Baja, California. I mean, we talked about Eduardo Sanchez, my, my tennis coach, um, and how close we are to Eduardo and Amelia. Um, the uh, Sean Eduardo Sanchez Tennis Center is in Tecate. Yeah. And my coach, Eduardo, spent a lot of time and money getting access to kids mm -hmm. and their ability to play tennis um, in honor of his son, the son that they lost. Um, we've been able to, fortunately, through barbecue and through the events that he puts on at Rancho Valencia, raise money to help them do that. But before we had this podcast, I was talking to him about what you, what you and everyone else has discussed yeah. with bringing in Baja, California. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, first, like to me, they're our, they're not just they're not our neighbors. They're no, it's they're, they're, it's just it, they're our they're, people. Yeah, it's a it's a bigger community. Yeah, it's just it's, a bigger it's part. An extension. Correct. And the so, zip code. It's not yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And that was one of my questions. Um, one of my one of my interview questions for this organization was, what are we doing across the border? Yeah. And uh, we are doing we are doing a lot. And we, and with Eduardo, I want to extend that um, to do more and do what's necessary because. Uh, well, one, if we're just talking about talent ID, you know, there's so many kids that are not getting these opportunities, whether it's tennis, soccer, football, basketball. Um, so we need to make sure we're just offering these opportunities. Sure. And so, um, you know, with unfortunately COVID right now, not being able to get across and do as much as we will do, um, just we have to we have to be patient. But um, yeah, working with Eduardo, I've been a part of his fundraiser for many years. Um, we would like to, we're gonna continue to, to promote that, help that as much as we can. Um, and then eventually, I mean, right now we are bringing donations over, uh, we're providing shoes. Um, one of my fr close friends, her son has a, 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 a 
charity of, uh, called Shoes to Share. Okay. Um, there's another one, one of our, our Youth Tennis San Diego Player Council, our president, she has her own foundation called um, uh, Second Serve. So we're just connecting with younger leaders. Yes. And they're really helping provide donations to, to Baja. Yeah. Um, but I really want to get down there and provide tennis. And whether that's being able to give them scholarships, which we have started to kids to come across the border and practice here at Barnes, um, or just extend what we're doing to our community, that's what's necessary in my, in my opinion. I mean, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk with a leader like you. I, two weeks ago, I sat down with the mayor of a city in Bulgaria, um, Pavel, and he's telling me about what they're doing and how he's sharing it on Facebook about paving roads, but they're also building sports programs. And just by sharing ideas like this, you're lining tennis courts and you're empowering a community and now you're doing that here but it's talking about access on a level on a global scale that if you have the internet and you can share these ideas yeah. a mayor in bulgaria can start building a tennis program for a country that has a lot of pride yeah. that would love to have a great tennis program yeah. but you just don't think it's possible uh -huh. you know now we're able to get back to the basics and now we can improve Baja tennis program. We can yeah. improve the inner city in San Diego and we can give people access to know you don't have to live in La Jolla or Del Mar to grow up playing tennis oh, or absolutely. to get on the court. Yeah. You can come right here to Barnes yeah. and there's a program for you. Well, I mean, even the, that mayor, you know, if he needs help, like yeah. to me, it's not, these are our people or those right. are their people. And I think that's what we need with our associations and federations that we're all together. Yeah. And so, you know, like right now, why is I'm, just, I'm thinking Nadal is his home is Roland Garros in yes. Spain they should be telling us how they get it you know yes. what are they coaching Correct. and we do have that cross yeah. uh, interaction but it, I think there could be more but when we're talking about you know, paving roads and yes. stuff like that we need to be in this together because um, it's I mean you, no matter where you go in the world there's like there's a place to play but it's the access and unless you think their idea is possible yeah. then people don't pursue that idea Sure. But if there's a basketball court and there's no hoop or no net, but then someone goes, well, it is possible. Yeah. We can actually make this happen. Yeah. There is a tennis court. We can fix it. And then we can actually have a place where everyone can play in the village yeah. or in the community that turns into something else. Yeah. That provides people an opportunity to do something great. Yeah. And that goes back to there's no, you don't have to fall in line to get to where your dreams are. Yeah. You know, I remember, I don't remember the individual's name, but he was a very, very good Division One college tennis player from an island with two tennis courts. And <laughs> one of them was like in a parking lot. Yes. And one of my former assistant coaches would tell me about him all the time. And like, you know, those, that, those are the kind of things you're yes. talking about. Like in yes. Bulgaria, Correct. pave a road and on some exit, you've got a, you got a little mini Correct. tennis court or something. And who knows, well, who knows who's going to come out exactly. of that? They're going to have a lot of grit, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Um, so Instagram, mm -hmm. Redondo Ryan underscore YTSD. Okay. And then on Facebook, Ryan Redondo. Great. And uh, here at the Barnes Tennis Center, www.barnstenniscenter.com. Awesome. Well, we're going to encourage Ryan and the Barnes Center to continue to produce media content. Don't be surprised if you see a podcast coming from them and you see all kinds of incredible yeah. streaming and all kinds of just amazing stuff. We're grateful for everyone that listens to the podcast. Um, please share the episode with anyone that loves tennis or is thinking about tennis or somebody that wants to blossom where they are. Um, Ryan, I really appreciate your time. Uh, check out the behind the scenes tour so you guys can uh, get an idea of what the facility is. And uh, hopefully we'll see you playing tennis no matter what age you are. Um, tennis doesn't discriminate, it's open to all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, you for got your it. time. Thank you.